Hello, this is Tanner Dykin, pastor at uh, Open Door Baptist Church, and uh, I'm back doing the second part of the uh, first night of my debate with uh, Todd Clifford. Uh, we'll be looking at his rebuttal section. We'll just go ahead and we'll, we'll finish out looking at uh, the first night of uh, what he said, and uh, I'll just go ahead and, and we'll get right back into this. All right, we are back. Apologize, we had just a little technical difficulties, but uh, Ben's got everything worked out. We're thankful for that. Uh, let me just respond to some of the things that Tanner had to say in his second affirmative. Uh, he said that I said, he said, I, he said, I said, he said that we are saved without any desire on our part. He says he never said that, but he necessarily implied it. When he said God does it all, either God does it all or God doesn't do anything. And so if we have to bring a desire to it, then we have to do something. Moreover, Tanner has repeatedly said that we don't and cannot do anything, and yet at the same time, later on, we'll say we have to trust in God. And so it, it can't be it can't be all God, but we have to trust in him, or it can't be all God, but we have to have a desire. He says God gives us the desire. Then it's all of God. There, there's no other, there's no other reasonable conclusion to draw. You can't have it all God, but you have to trust in him. But if you do trust in him, it's because God told you, made you trust in him. And so uh, and so if God has to cause the desire, then it's still all it's still all of God and man doesn't do anything. So therefore, it's inconsistent for Tanner to even say that we have to trust in God or have a desire to be saved. Uh, I want to go. All right. So uh, there, uh, you know, he, he uh, you know, gives us this uh, objection that uh, if I say and, and, and if we say, if the scripture says that uh, a person has desires you know in in the in the in the act of of salvation and god's acting in salvation if, if a person has desires to be saved if they have faith toward god if they love jesus christ uh then that means that it is uh it it cannot be by the activity of god or that that, that if if we say that in other words, if, if we say that God is the one that gives desires, that, that he is the one that, that, that causes us to love Jesus Christ and causes us to have faith in Jesus Christ, that therefore we do not love Jesus Christ or, or we do not have faith in Jesus Christ. He's essentially trying to, to, to throw me into a corner and say that if, if you say that God does all of this, that God is the one that gives desires, then it means that man does not have desires or, or that a, a person who is being saved does not have a desire to be saved. And, and that's just silly. Um, you know, the, the, when we say that God gives the desire to be saved, that necessarily entails that the person to whom he gives the desires ends up with a desire to be saved. You see, desires are involved. It's just that we say, if a person desires to be saved, it's because God gives them that desire. If somebody loves Jesus Christ, it is because he first loved them. And so, you know, this, it's, it's a, a somewhat of a small point here. It's it's not really a a a, a point where he's contending with a, a a passage of scripture that I'm looking at, and that that was really what I was looking for. But it, it was sort of a a point where he was trying to point out some kind of a philosophical inconsistency, and there just is no inconsistency where he's he's pointing it out. And so, uh, you know, there we have that. And let's just uh, go ahead and look at what else he has to say here. I want to go back to the text uh, with, a, with respect to Romans 10, I meant not Romans 10, it's going to be Romans 6 and verse 17. Even, even if the word also could be used, which I don't know any translation that uses the word also instead of the word then. All the translations, being then made free from sin. All right, I'll grant it. Let's just say it is also. Being also made free from sin. You became servants of righteousness. It's still time stamped to obeying from the heart that form of doctrine. Now, Okay, um, you know, here's a, another point regarding uh, you know, Romans 6, 17, and 18. And, uh, you know, this is just something I, I want to look at again. I know I looked at it in the last video. Uh, 
but he says that there is no translation which understands um you know how the sense that i was giving a verse 18 uh that 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 is you know that gives that sense of the word well first i would argue that that the king james is open to that interpretation of the beginning of verse 18 right the word then is a little bit looser in the english language than uh uh you know todd is 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 letting on here uh, it can it definitely can mean temporal priority um but it can it can also mean that you know this is true right it's it's sort of just a a word to to transition you know being then made free from sin you know uh, it's it's sort of a, a way of transitioning um and it doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that what came before was the cause of what comes after you know uh it, it can just you know be a transitionary statement but uh, you know, even though the word the word also, uh, I, I don't know of any translation that uses the word also there. The same sense of not, you know, that that this causes that, but sort of a transitionary, you know, going between, uh, you know, one verse to the next, one statement to the next, is is actually given in other translations, and and two notable ones would be the New King James translation and the MEV translation. Now, you know, uh, I, I exclusively use the King James in my, uh, you know, my devotion, in my preaching, in, in liturgy and everything. Um, but I just thought I'd point this out to Todd in case he, you know, he uh, hadn't realized this. Um, in the New King James, uh, beginning at the middle of verse 17, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were to which you were delivered. And you notice what I said in the last video is brought out here in the New King James. That that um, it's it's brought out fairly clearly that the, the believers are the ones that are delivered, not the doctrine, right? In verse eighteen, and having been set free from sin, you became serve, uh, slaves of righteousness. Um, you know, there again, it's it's not, you know, being because of this made free from sin, as you know, the usage of the word then is is being implied by Todd, um, but and having been made uh, been set free from sin, just simply, and you were set free from sin. Um, it's it it doesn't necessarily mean that what came before was the cause. It might, you know. Uh, it, it it might be and especially if you if you take what i said in the, the last you know uh one of these videos about that it's it's not the doctrine which is delivered up but rather it's the believers who are delivered up even then there wouldn't be any problem with taking uh taking this to be that because of this you were made free from sin or, or or that that you were made free from sin in this kind of kind of idea um so that's the, the New King James, and the MEV is basically, you know, the same, just slightly different wording. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were entrusted. Again, the one that's, that's, that's being entrusted, that's being delivered up, is the believers here. It's that they are being entrusted to this doctrine. They, they've been delivered from sin, entrusted to this doctrine. And having been freed from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. So it's a, a similar wording there, but, um, you know, uh, I just thought I'd, I'd make mention of that, you know, here uh, for uh, a moment. Uh, but one final point uh, about this passage is that the uh, being made free from sin, that they were made free from sin, uh, you know, that that right there, that action of being made made free um, is passive. It's grammatically passive. Uh, it's not something that they they did something to affect this in themselves, or they did something as a condition to get this to themselves. But rather, it it's a passive act.
fact. And that's just another small point. But, you know, they, they were made free. And that comes through very clearly in the English. They were made free. Um, they, they did not make themselves free. They, they, they did not uh, become free by themselves. They were made free. It's, it's passive. It's done to them. And, uh, you know, so there, you know, is a little there. What we see here in the passage is just, it's, it's just straightly that God sets them free. And when he sets them free, they obey the doctrine that, that he gives, right? They, they obey righteousness rather than sin. You know, God be thanked. He's the one doing this. He sets free and then they obey the doctrine. And that's, that's pretty, pretty simple, uh, there. Um, now, uh, we'll just go ahead and, and watch a little bit more what he says here. The form of doctrine that was obeyed from the heart that brought to these individuals, the remission of their sins. And Paul answers that question in Romans chapter six. And beginning in verse number one, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now catch this. Or know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. They were no longer the slaves of sin there in verse 17 and 18. When did they cease to become the slaves of sin? When they obeyed from the heart the doctrine delivered to them. What was the doctrine that was delivered to them? The doctrine of being buried with Christ in baptism. Tanner has to answer this question. When is a man raised in newness of life? When is he raised in newness of life? And Paul says that the newness of life comes only after we are baptized, buried with Christ in baptism. Second question Tanner would have to answer from this text, what does it mean to be planted together in the likeness of his death? And the obvious answer is that is a reference to being baptized. And note that it is a condition. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, if we have been baptized, then we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, then or also, makes no difference whatsoever that, uh, that, uh, that one obeys from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered to them, being then made free from sin, they became the servants of righteousness. And Paul said that doctrine, that form of doctrine, that obedience is being buried with Christ in baptism. And so that's when newness of life takes place. That's when being in the likeness of his resurrection uh, becomes, uh, becomes a reality. And so Romans chapter 6, 17, uh, in, no way, in no way helps uh, Tanner's argument uh, with regard to uh, faith only. Uh, Tanner... All right. Um, so he says a lot here. And there are a couple of things that I would like to, to point out here. Um, first is... I would have liked to see this, you know, and, and if he, if, if he can, you know, send this to me later, if he, if he watches this later and, uh, he wants to, you know, send it to me, um, I would like to know specifically why it is that he, he takes the form of doctrine to which they were delivered, right? The form of doctrine that's spoken of in, in verse 17. Why does he take that to mean baptism? You know, is there a, an ex, a specific reason why that is, or is that kind of an assumption that's, that's given, you know, that, that, that he, he, he kind of, you know, he thinks, well, baptism was talked about immediately prior, you know, and, and so it, it can't refer to anything else other than baptism. And, you know, that's, that, that's fairly weak in my opinion, just to say that it was immediately prior. It was the last answer to the last question that was, that was raised by the imaginary objector that Paul is usual, using. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know why he would assume that, that there are several things that it could mean. It could mean baptism. It could also mean uh, faith in Christ, right? That, that, that we obey the call to have faith in Christ, to trust in him. 
and that's that's perfectly fine with uh, you know sola fide. That there's nothing wrong with that. Um, of course, again, this passage is still talking about how the believers were delivered to obedience, um, not how their obedience led to their deliverance. But uh, you know that's that's uh, two things. Another thing is he asked um, he asked a couple of questions here, and let me you know just make sure that I I get this correct. In in verse five, um, in in verse four, uh, rather. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And his question is, you know, uh, what it, he asks, what does it mean to walk in newness of life, right? And that's, that's obvious. It's the Christian life. You know, that's, that's, that's what we are, are called to walk in. You know, we've been made new in Christ and we're called to, to live out that reality. And um, he asks, you know, what does it mean to, to be in the likeness of his death? Well, that's, that's again, obviously baptism, right? We, we are baptized in the likeness of his death so that we may be in the likeness of his resurrection. But th the way he asked the question is, is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit slanted. He, he assumes that because baptism being buried in the likeness of his death that because that is connected with being in the likeness of his resurrection or being uh, walking in the new life that necessarily this means that baptism aff uh, uh, affects the the uh, the new life it, 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 it gives the new life uh, and that's just not explicit in this passage, the, 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 the language, again, that's being used is likeness language. It's imagistic language. It's, it's giving us an image of what these spiritual realities are. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're buried in the likeness of his death in baptism. But is, that, is, is going down into the water the substance of his death? No, it's, it's the likeness. So also, when we come up out of the water, we are told to, to, to be to, to walk in newness of life, but does that mean that being raised out of the water actually affects, it, it actually gives newness of life? Or is it simply saying that when we are taken up out of the water, we should go forth and walk in the new life that we have in Christ Jesus? And I would say that, that that's what it's saying, right? We, we have, we have, uh, participated in this drama of, of uh, reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so therefore, we should continue this drama throughout our lives. We should continue in, to play the role of walking in newness of life as we have been raised up in the symbol of baptism. Again, this is just, just imagistic, language. It's, it's very, you know, uh, uh, very standard in, in, uh, you know, uh, theology, you know, in, in, uh, you know, Israelite thinking in those days, uh, that these things are not the substance of what they represent, but they're closely, they're closely tied together. They're closely associated together. And, uh, you know, so, as far as those questions, that's how I would kind of, I would kind of want to, you know, pull that out, bring this passage, uh, you know, and, and examine it and, and look at it for what it, what it's saying itself. Um, now there's a final, um, you know, portion of this. He, he goes, oh, you know, his first rebuttal, he, he goes over, um, uh, the, uh, examples that he gave from the Old Testament. Uh, he, he tries to answer my criticism of that, that he's somewhat assuming that, that the, his application of them, and, and he's kind of assuming that they are talking about justification, which is the, you know, topic of our, our discussion. 
and uh, you know I, I would have liked again to see him pull this out a little bit more so that we could we could see some you know interactions and criticisms about it and uh, you know he at that point at this point in the the rebuttal he, he just again points to Hebrews chapter 11 uh, but if we look at Hebrews 11 justification language is not used what is used is uh, again this idea of of walking in faith of living by faith uh the the, the lifelong effort of uh of, of of trusting in christ and all that we do and how doing this brings a good report on us before the world we are vindicated before the world and through that perseverance we finally do reach our heavenly home, right? It's not justification language, it's perseverance language, and it's vindication language. And, uh, you know, so uh, there we have that. Uh, the final uh, things that I want to look at uh, are his uh, closing statement. Uh, most of it, because there were some technical difficulties, he, he wasn't able to hear my... Um, my closing statement, uh, he basically just had to go back to his notes and say, you know, a few things, make a few criticisms of some of the stuff that I had said before, um, you know, which is understandable. Um, you know, we understand that. And, uh, but there, there was, uh, you know, one thing that I kind of wanted to look at that he had said, and it's in the context of a, uh, an analogy that he uses about endorsing a check and uh you know what he was saying is that if he received a uh an inheritance check an estate check from his uh parents it, you know they pass away they leave him some money and uh you know he takes the check and he uh, goes to endorse the check to deposit it and he says that what when he deposits that check, that he is not earning the check, that it is a you know it's 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 unmerited, it's 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 given to him, uh, you know by his his parents didn't deserve it, didn't work for it. That was his parents' work, and we understand that. And he was saying, nonetheless, there are conditions for receiving the money there are legal conditions that he has to namely endorse the check right he has to put his name on the back of it and then of course you know go somewhere where he can get you know the money out of it um and he makes a statement and it was a miss you know i know that he he misspoke likely when he said this but it's nonetheless a good criticism of this analogy that he uses. And I just want us to listen for it here. And those are the conditions that are attached to receiving a check, to administering or making the, the power behind a check a reality. And so, and so, so it is with obedience to the commands of God. Now, you know, just I'll give you a moment if you caught what he said there. Um, what he said was that endorsing a check is necessary to make the power of the check a reality. And I know that if he went back and he listened to this, or if he, you know, comprehended that he said that in the moment, um, he would probably want to say he misspoke and, you know, I'd give him the, the benefit of the doubt on that one. Um, nonetheless, I think it's a good criticism that legally speaking, you know, endorsing a check is something that we have to do. Otherwise, the check is worthless. Otherwise, anyone could pick the check up. You know, uh, you know, if, if we don't endorse the check, anyone can pick the check up and take it to the bank and get nothing out of it. Um, you know, if, if, if we, if, if, you know, Todd were not to sign the check, it would just be a piece of paper. It would be completely worthless. And, it seems to me that if Christ's merit, if, if, if his salvation is dependent on me actualizing it, me, in, in a sense, endorsing it, then that makes my authority greater than 
Christ's authority, right? Uh, it, it, it seems to put me as the arbiter over whether or not Christ's atonement will actually do anything. Just like in the endorsement of a check puts up in the air, it, or not in the air, it puts in my hands, whether or not that check will be cashed, right? Whether it will be deposited. And so this, this analogy, I don't think, it, I don't think it helps. I think it, it, it hurts the position uh, because God must be glorified in salvation. Uh, you know, the Lord said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. There, there's no uh, contingency in that. There, there's, there's no doubt whether God will have mercy on those whom he will have mercy. Uh, it, it's, it's not th that way with a check, right? It's up in the air whether that check will be, uh, the mo you know, the, the money that that check represents will be given to, you know, the person it's made out to. But with God, it is a sure reality. He will do this by his own power, not by power that's given to him, by the creature. God will do this. We don't have to make the power of God a reality. It already is a reality, and God can have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and uh, that doesn't, uh, whatever we do does not, um, it does not uh, make it a reality or, uh, or keep it from becoming a reality. Uh, anyway, that's the uh, first night of the debate. Uh, hopefully these videos are uh, a lot shorter than before, and uh, I'll be, uh, sometime soon I'll be doing some more on the second night of the debate. And uh, so with that, this is Tanner Dykin. Uh, God blessings.